I-1, also known under the codename Seas of Murders. What they soon found was that these slain victims were an acclaimed horror writer hmm. Stephen King said of his interaction with the administrator, one of we the oddest things going. to happen to me out on the road was an autograph session in Westbrook, I think. A larger gentleman approached the table with a copy of The Stand, yeah, said he was a big fan. Now, I think I might have been a little crazy here, but when I looked at his hand holding the book, it was green. I asked if he was okay, and I looked up into his eye. No. No, I don't even think we humor that one anymore. It's like the mid-tier research staff telling the new people there's a pool on the third uh. floor. Nobody really believes it, but a couple people every year try and... ...diseases. It is a medicine, potion, or other item that can pull a patient back from the brink of death <coughs> and save someone from even the worst of circumstances. We have never joined. It's a wonderful idea. One that would save countless lives, put a stop to untold needless suffering, and improve the human experience. Actually, I'm hungry. Let's head to the cafeteria. Cafeteria, cafeteria, cafeteria. Uh, cafeteria is this? Is this a cafeteria? Yeah. Hi, how can I help you? Yeah, hi, uh, a rocket pizza, please. So, here you go. Thanks. Let's sit down and eat it, I guess. Let's head outside now. <sighs> head out in the courtyard, yo. It's another day in the SCP Foundation. Press play and have a join. It's like 008, but what else could it cure? What was the extent of its marvelous medical power, if any? Could it cure an ailment with virtually no basis in modern <sighs> medical understanding? Next, one pill was approved and allocated for testing with SCP-409. SCP-409 is a rock formation resembling a large quartz crystal. It is kept in a sealed granite case, and no one is permitted to touch it with any substance other than granite. during active experimentation. Anyone who comes into physical contact... Don't go too far, his mother calls out as she watches her son head in the direction of one of the buildings. The boy stops in the shadow of one of the large satellite dishes and sits down in the grass to resume his monster's path of destruction across the countryside. As the monster moves through the tall grass... Let's pause it! Head to my room. Where the fuck is my room? Here. Seven in the morning. Let's chill out in the courtyard now. Hmm. Press play. So, the shadow he is sitting in suddenly starts Have to Have a joint shift. for the day. The boy looks up to see that the satellite dish on top of the building is hmm. moving. With a groan, it begins to turn and change its angle. And it isn't just the one in the building closest to him that's moving. You can see that each of the six satellite dishes are doing the same thing. They're all turning to point towards the same spot on the horizon. The boy squints <coughs> at the satellite and sees what they're all now directed towards. Off, far in the distance, is a real monster. It's a massive looking creature. A huge half fish, half lizard, covered in scales and spiky fins. It must be at least 50 meters tall or more. And it's coming straight towards him. The boy can already hear the sounds of its giant webbed feet stomping and shaking the ground. And as it gets closer, its high-pitched shrieks and cries become audible too. Mm. Adding to the cacophony, an air raid siren begins to wail, followed by the sounds of gunfire, the marching of hundreds of boots, and the roar of engines. The boy looks around, but he doesn't see any of it. 
It's just him, the buildings, and the monster. The boy can't run, though. He's frozen in fear. All he can do is watch as it swipes at trees and power lines, knocking them down with ease, all while getting closer and closer. The satellite dishes finally finish their slow alignment, and there's a loud humming noise, followed by a loud cracking sound, as each one emits a bright beam of electricity at the monster. The creature stops its assault and howls in pain as the six satellites focus their beams on it. The beams disappear, and the monster appears stunned, but then it looks up and continues to come forward, this time even faster than before. The monster is only hundreds of feet away now, and the boy doesn't know what to do. He's too scared to even scream for help. He closes his eyes and starts to cry when he's abruptly lifted into the air. The boy opens his eyes to see that it's his father. He picks up the boy and starts to run as fast as he can. The boy can see over his father's shoulder that the monster has not changed its course to follow them. It seems to still be focused on the building he was playing next to. The monster finally reaches the building and begins swiping at it, tearing it apart as the other satellites slowly realign, all pointing at the creature once again. The sound of the invisible army increases, and the monster reels as if it is struck by unseen weapons. It suddenly rears back in pain as an artillery shell appears just feet away from it before exploding in the creature's face. But nothing seems able to deter it, and it keeps clawing at the building with the satellite dish. The father finally reaches the mother, who grabs the boy and embraces him tightly. There is a loud noise, and the family turns to watch as the monster finishes destroying the building and turns its attention to one of the others. But then the dishes unleash another blast of electricity at it with a thunderous crack. The creature howls in pain as it stumbles and falls to its knees. It is struggling to get back up when yet another blast hits it and it falls to the ground. It breathes a couple of final, labored breaths before it closes its eyes, its enormous tongue lolling out of its mouth. The creature is finally dead. A loud celebratory cheer goes up in the empty field from what sounds like hundreds of people as the creature begins to slowly fade from view before eventually disappearing completely. Meanwhile, all the family can do is stare in amazement at the bizarre scene they have just witnessed. The extremely strange events that just befell this average family may sound like the plot of a movie, and in some ways, it was, because this is SCP-2954, also known as Looping Kaiju Killing. SCP-2954 is an anomaly that consists of several distinct components. The first, SCP-2954-1A, are the six large structures that resemble buildings with satellite dishes, which are located near a now-deserted rural town in Japan. The word resemble is very important, because these are not actual satellite dishes, but instead appear to be nothing more than facsimiles of real ones. The interior of the SCP-2954-1A buildings lack all of the mechanical components one would expect to find inside, and instead contain only a crude rope and pulley system, which control the satellite dishes on the building's roof. Uh. Despite their lack of internal machinery, the satellite did double shift. It's late, and the interstate is for the and day. no cars visible either in front or behind you. It's only about a 20-minute drive. You know you're going to struggle to stay awake, even in this old beater that shakes and rattles as it travels down the long street. Isaac, aka 001. I need you to experiment with a new SCP what we got. Okay, got that. This way. Down here. This one right here. Go in. Keep going. Whatever. Approach the SCP. Hit the SCP. Let's hear the big guy. Keep hitting the SCP. Let's hear the big guy. Huh? What you gonna do, big guy? Give us a second. Let me set him on fire, that should do it. Hit it. Keep hitting it. Mm. 
Come on, what's, what's your gun? Gonna do, big guy. What you gonna do, big guy, huh? What you gonna do, big guy? Huh, big guy? What you gonna do, huh, big guy? Come on. Come on, you son of a bitch. Do it. Do it, you son of a bitch. Come on, you piece of shit. Come on, you son of a bitch. Kill me. Now that's more fucking like it. Finally. Let's chill in the fucking courtyard. <laughs> Press play. Now in the life, the explorer have a joint for the death. Have a joint for the die. It's a huge flying lizard of some kind, or at least it was at one time. Since now the majority of its body is made only of bone, what scraps of flesh are left hang off in rotten ribbons. The monster opens its mouth and roars at the explorer. Its foul breath smells like a mausoleum opening up, hitting the explorer in the face. The explorer tries to run, but the monster swipes up with a bony wing that still has a few blackened strips of leathery skin on it and knocks into the ground. He is pinned to the floor with a huge spiny claw as the creature opens its mouth, roaring again before moving its head down to start feasting on its meal. The explorer closes his eyes, bracing himself to be eaten alive. When the creature suddenly lets out an ear-piercing scream, the explorer opens his eyes to see the jeweled spear sticking out of one of the few spots of flesh remaining on the creature's clawed foot and gripping the shaft is his assistant. She looks a little worse for wear, but she's alive. She offers him a hand to help him up. They need to get out of there. But first, the explorer pulls the spear from the monster's claw. The two start running, doing everything they can to avoid the monster as it claws and swipes at them. They spot an illuminated opening at the other end of the vast room. With no other option, start heading towards it. As they get closer, they can see it's just what they needed. Daylight. Escape. They both slide to a stop at the cusp of the opening, nearly tumbling over the edge. On the other side, the tunnel opening up out of the side of the temple gives way to nothing but air, and a drop of hundreds of feet down to the jungle below. They turn to see the monster still rushing towards them, and without time to think any longer, they both jump, just seconds before the creature snaps its bony jaws in the place where they were standing. It's too big to fit anything more than its mouth out the door, and it howls and screams as they fall through the air before crashing to the ground below. The assistant slowly opens her eyes to see someone. It's their guide. He is cradling her head and asking if she's okay. She sits up, dazed and more than a little bruised from her fall. She asks the guide where the explorer is, if he's alright. The guide lowers his eyes, looking as though he'd rather not answer. He points next to them without looking, and the assistant turns to see the explorer lying on the ground a few feet away from them, his body impaled on the jeweled spear. History is full of tales and legends about gods, monsters, and everything in between. But not all of these are just stories. And in fact, sometimes the reality is even more terrifying than what we could envision. And that is exactly the case when it comes to SCP-4959, also known as the Teotihuacan Pterodactylactory. SCP-4959 is a huge creature that resembles a pterosaur, which were flying reptiles that existed during the Mesozoic era. While pterosaurs have been extinct for millions of years, SCP-4959 is very much alive, or at the very least, animate. This mass god at one point, the fact that we are now the ones responsible for feeding it and keeping it happy, means that in a sense, we are the reptiles that existed during the Mesozoic era. While pterosaurs have been extinct for millions of years, SCP-4959 is very much alive, or at the very least, animate. This massive anomaly, whose wingspan stretches approximately 50 meters, is in a living state of decomposition, with roughly 70% of its flesh having rotted or otherwise fallen away, leaving only small patches of skin and decaying tissue clinging. I'm fucking hungry. Return to the cafeteria. Man.
Cafeteria, cafeteria, is this cafeteria? Yeah, it is. <coughs> hi, how can I help you? Yeah, hi, I would like to a book. A pizza, please. So, here you go. Thank you. But sit down and eat. Let's head outside now. To the courtyard. Press play. With bones, the flesh that does remain shows no signs of further decomposition, though, as if it is permanently locked into this specific stage of advanced decay. Hmm. Tests of 4959's flesh have shown no apparent abnormalities, save for a slightly higher than expected concentration of iridium. Its eyes are no longer present, but the eye sockets somehow shine with a bright green light, though the source of this luminescence is unknown. When angered, the creature also emits a multicolored corona of fire from its wings, skull, and neck. SCP-4959 was discovered in a gigantic chamber beneath the Temple of the Feathered Serpent in Teotihuacan, Mexico. A number of tunnels connect to the chamber, and these, too, are anything but empty. Lurking within the temple's many twisting passages are entities that have been designated SCP-4959-A. These humanoid-sized creatures appear to be constructed of various human and pterosaur bones, creating an all-new creature that is an amalgamation of both. The bones are connected to a central stone-like heart, but it is unknown if this heart was carved from stone, or if it was at one time a real heart that turned to stone through a process of ossification, nor is it fully understood just how the bones are connected to it or stayed together. The 4959-A entities also have a number of varying adornments on their bodies, which can include strips of decayed fabric, feathers, and precious stones that resemble those worn by the indigenous people who resided in the area many centuries ago. SCP-4959 is carnivorous, though it is unknown if it requires or simply desires to feed. Regardless, it seems to be the task of the SCP-4959-A entities to bring it meals, since the 4959 creature itself is too large to leave its chamber beneath the temple. The hallways and passages that originally connected the temple to the chamber housing SCP-4959 have all collapsed, and the only tunnels now leading to it were most likely dug into the rock and earth by the 4959-A entities. They search through these tunnels, most often working at night, looking for small animals like birds and lizards, but also occasionally finding a larger animal or even a human who has somehow found themselves inside. They will then bring their live prey directly to the giant pterosaur, offering them up as both a meal and a sacrifice. SCP-4959 will then proceed to eat the prey whole, sometimes consuming the 4959-A entity at the same time as well. The temple itself is covered in carvings and murals that give numerous hints as to the origin of SCP-4959. While it is unknown just how it got there, it appears as though the local people discovered the creature within its chamber and regarded it as an avatar of their feathered serpent god, or perhaps another unknown deity. A temple was constructed at the site, and they soon began making sacrifices to the god creature that lived beneath, starting with small animals, but then progressing to human sacrifices on important holy days. There is also something else shown in the murals that looks to be of great importance. It seems as though SCP-4959 possessed a sort of heart, which is depicted as a large gemstone, described as being red as blood and bright as the rising sun. This gemstone was previously housed at the pinnacle of the temple, though its current location is unknown. Following intense study of the site by SCP Foundation historians, a narrative was pieced together that may explain at least some of what happened there. It seems as though there was an uprising within the local population in roughly the 6th century AD. A conflict had arisen amongst the people as to whether this really was a god or something else, something evil. Those who doubted the deific origins of SCP-4959 wrested control of the temple and journeyed into its depths to attempt to kill the creature. The many scorch marks on the wall are a testament to the battle that likely took place, and while they suffered many losses, it appears as though they were at least able to seal the chamber shut. It is currently unknown what became of the great jewel on top of the temple after this, but its location is of great interest to the Foundation, given that it may well be the source of SCP-4959's longevity. SCP-4959 has been classified as Euclid, and it continues to be contained within the chamber beneath the Temple of the Feathered Serpent, though all of the tunnel entrances leading into it have been blocked by reinforced gates.
If new ones are discovered as the result of SCP-4959-A's continued tunneling, they too are to be gated and sealed. Once per week, a large live animal, most often a cow, is deposited down a shaft that leads directly to the chamber. And so far, this seems to be keeping SCP-4959 content to stay within its tomb. Just what is SCP-4959? And what are the half-man, half-pterosaur creatures who serve it? Are they former human sacrifices, now destined to live in eternity in servitude to their master? If SCP-4959 was a god at one point, the fact that we are now the ones responsible for feeding it and keeping it happy means that in a sense, we are the ones serving it now. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-3700, The Tides of War, for another anomaly with godlike implications. And make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a single anomaly as we delve further and further into the... Got your number? Flightmates.com.au is here. Before the video starts, I would like to ask that you guys subscribe to my channel, turn on the bell for notifications, leave a comment down below, and like the video. I would be an instant Santa with the instant scratches. Grab the latest range in stores today. Another join. Uh, oh, 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 ah, ah, ah. I see it, I see it. Uh. <laughs> it's their hair, right? Yes. Okay, okay. No, good, good, it, good. it's definitely the sofa. I, I, I'm it's just checking, I'm just checking. I'm a little colorblind. How do you, how, how do you see? It's... Rather complicated. Uh, uh, I wouldn't get into it. I don't know. It was a little weird. Uh, whose turn is it again? Purple? Um, I spy something blue. Since you're going in first, it's gonna be easy. I'll hand it to. 
guys. Let me tell you something. The Chaos Insurgency tried the same bullshit. You wouldn't know what happened. That didn't work either. I'm still fucked either way. To die, human. When I was younger, I was a kid. I used to have this book about ropes. Or my father. My father helped me with those. Taught me how to do these things. How to do those things. So helps teach me. He taught me how to undo a lot of knots. shoot on the side of this, yes. That's the thing. There is no real weight. 
Well, where's the mouth? Take him off? Oh. Let's have another joint. If a blur mouth, you are one-eyed, I think the whole barn is a cut out. I'm being honest, I'm kind of tempted to shoot you. <sighs> Not in a threatening no. way. The K mouse uh, is threatening way. I can't put us in threat. Huh. No. I meant I as a way so we can get in there. I'm not gonna lie. You were expecting us. You were expecting us when we could probably just ask for more reinforcement if they were. What's. It's too good. will have bestowed upon them the immunity to ice and cold. Of course, that doesn't sound amazing, but for someone no longer necessary, he is ignored and it has no join. time and time. <clears throat> Personal record, Dr. Brian Virgil. This will likely be my last recording. My requests to shut down the FEV program have repeatedly been denied. I have left nothing useful in the last ten years. Why does father insist on continuing? The man never sleeps. So they say. We have no join. Mary who never sleeps. This will be tricky to steal from her. Do you accept a... Isaac, a.k.a. SCP-001. Watch up. Follow me.
I need you to go into a simulation and go undercover in the simulation world. It's Apocalypse world by the way. Okay? Why? Just do it. How long will I have to stay? I don't know. Okay, just do it. This the room? Yeah, this is the room. Okay, which one? This one here. Good luck. Whatever. Oh, where am I? Okay, so this is the place. Hey boss, who the fuck are you? Don't remember me boss, you're part of the Raiders. Oh, okay. The Raiders. See boss, see ya. Cool. Where the fuck do I go outside? How the fuck do I go outside, dude? I need my... Let's have a look in here. Hell yeah. Take that, take that. Take this. Cool. Put this on, put this on. Put this on here. Put this here, buddy. Hell yeah. Now let's put. Now let's. Okay, let's grab. Good, I grab Alison. Phone. Hell yeah, buddy. A actual compound. Hell yeah. This person is living life. AKA me. Fiber optics. Good, good, good. I assume that's been done. Zero packet loss. That sounds have a joint. to me. And uh, might need to do this one as well. And there we go. Next door neighbour provides uh, tier four. Zero packet loss. That should be done in that case.